Howdy. Um, sorry. I uh, haven't been teaching. I'm going through a whole bunch of stuff personally. Uh, there's some health issues in my family and um, just it's a tough time and I haven't had the emotional energy to teach. But uh, I'll be back at it when the Lord raises me up. He He's faithful. He always raises me up. Um, <clears throat> but I do feel like I need to speak to something. Um, the difference between a wolf uh, and someone you should receive in the fellowship or the difference between someone who's accursed and someone you should receive in the fellowship. And when I say the difference between a wolf or a accursed person, uh, someone who is to be accursed, uh, people think that these can't be believers. Um, and then they go to the extreme and say every believer is in the fel is should be received in the fellowship, but that's just not true. Um, can an accursed person be saved? Well, you think accursed means not saved. Um, that's what I see a lot is people think, oh, you're saying I'm not saved. Uh, you're saying they're not saved. To be accursed, anathema, means that you are not to be fellowshiped with. Um, but it's more than just don't eat, even eat with the guy who's a idolater and an immoral person. It's for them to be ashamed. And no, an accursed person is you're not even supposed to be guessing whether they're a brother anymore because they are showing all the signs of a wolf. Um, now, a wolf is not a toxic person or a narcissist or somebody you don't like and they're always annoying and they're just rude and no. Biblically, a wolf is someone who uses the scripture to tear people apart, uh, tear their assurance in their salvation um, mainly, or tear away the peace they have with God through justification and point them away from the gospel, put stumbling blocks in front of them, uh, damage their conscience, damage their bold pr approach to God, and they do it deliberately. Um, that's a wolf, and that's also someone to be accursed. Now the problem is, is that accursed wolves, whether they're saved or not, <clears throat> Because they're railing against the doctrine of Christ, they are no longer showing any of the things that we look for as evidence that someone's saved. Um, the evidence that someone is saved is not that they're a nice person, or that they invited you to dinner, or that they lead the Bible study, or that they're the pastor, uh, and they've won everybody to the Lord, and they're so effective and fruitful. Uh, Note the definition of a believer that we can recognize is the testimony of God concerning his son. They possess the testimony and they agree with it. And that's what 1 John is about. How to recognize antichrists who deny all the things that are essential that a believer confesses about Jesus Christ. And what a believer confesses about Jesus Christ is not his own testimony. So 1 John 5 is says, uh, 1 John 5 says, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. And this is the testimony which he's testified concerning his son. And whoever believes the testimony is born of God. Whoever has the, uh, believes the testimony has the testimony in himself because it is the spirit that testifies. And it's the testimony of God concerning his son that is our basis for assurance that we have eternal life and our basis for knowing who's a brother. So, if someone says, I believe the gospel, most people say, then that's my brother. But that's not what 1 John says. 1 John says, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. And this is the testimony that he has testified concerning his son. Now, the testimony of the son is all through the scriptures. God's testimony concerning his son starts in Genesis. The volume of the book is written of me. And the gospel was promised beforehand in the writings of the prophets. Uh, it's the testimony. And it's consistent through the scripture. And by the way, the same way you recognize a brother is the same way you recognize how to interpret the Bible and whether something 
you know, people about my James teaching will say, well, all scripture is God breathed and it's profitable for doctrine. That's true. It's all profitable for doctrine, but it's not all the doctrine. Some of it is the backstory. Some of it is the contrast. Some of it describes the, the nature of the warfare that tries to uh, keep people from understanding the doctrine and is the contrast to the doctrine, and yet it's profitable for the doctrine to understand all these things. Um, okay, so the doctrine of Christ is God's testimony concerning his son. The law, you know, the Ten Commandments, is not the gospel. <laughs> it's not the doctrine. It's not the testimony of God concerning his son. In a sense, it's an anti-type that bears witness to his righteousness, but his righteousness is manifested apart from the law. Do you even know what I mean when I say that? Um, the, do you know what I mean when I say that Christ's righteousness is higher than what the law describes? You know, uh, per adventure, uh, a good man, a man might dare to die for a good man, but God commends his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the ungodly. And he's righteous to do so. The law doesn't describe that. You can't find the, in the law any really mercy uh, in the Ten Commandments. It's all a demand on you and you failed every point. Do you know how to distinguish between law and gospel or is it all the same to you? See, the, so the way we recognize the gospel and distinguish it from the law is the same way we even learn to recognize brothers. Do they have the testimony concerning God's son? Do they agree with it? The law doesn't tell you that Christ died for your sins. According to the scriptures, <laughs> rose on the third day. It doesn't tell you anything other than you're guilty. Well, so does an antichrist. Now, I'm not saying that the law is spiritual, good, and holy, but it's got to be used in its context. But an antichrist is someone who's not good, holy, and he's an enemy of the doctrine of Christ because he, the law does not rail against the doctrine of Christ. The law is not in opposition to the doctrine of Christ. The law was added for transgressions and should be used lawfully to show people their need for Christ. But an antichrist is not trying to show you your need for Christ. They are actually disagreeing with the doctrine of Christ. The law doesn't disagree with the doctrine of Christ. It just reveals uh, your sinfulness and does not reveal the doctrine of Christ. And so therefore it's different than the doctrine of Christ. It's different than the testimony of God concerning his son. Is it profitable for doctrine? Yes, because it's the schoolmaster to show your need for Christ. Um, but it's not, but, but, but the way you're saved is by believing the doctrine of God concerning his son. And that's all the promises concerning what he would accomplish in Christ. The law shows you your need, but the promise shows you Christ. The law is a shadow. Christ is the reality. And you have to make that kind of distinction. And we're also required to make that kind of distinction when it comes to so-called brothers who say, I believe the gospel, but that is not the same thing as testifying concerning God's son. Uh, there's many people that say they believe the gospel and yet refute and deny every point. Okay, now that's a person who at least has a problem in their faith. But a wolf and an accursed person goes beyond that because they don't just deny it for themselves. They're trying to deny it for you to bring you into bondage and to damage your conscience and to attack you with the scripture to undermine the doctrine of Christ. That's an accursed person. And that's someone who has another gospel. So Galatians says, I marvel that you were so soon moved from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which isn't another gospel. He said, it's not another gospel. Only some would seek to trouble you by perverting the gospel of Christ. So it's the true gospel, but it's a perversion of it. It's, it's a undermining of it by people who deliberately, they're seeking to trouble you. They seek to trouble you, to pervert it, to seek to trouble you. This is someone who says, I'm a believer, and then starts undermining your foundation. And these are, in many cases, false brethren, crept in unaware to spy out our liberty and bring us into bondage. But even if they're not, to be, they're to be accursed. Because Paul said, if I, and he's a believer, he's a brother, or anybody else or an angel from heaven, 
preaches another gospel other than the one we preach, let him be accursed. And don't listen to the pastors who all tell you that's talking about Mormonism. No, it's talking about the person who stands in the position of presenting, supposedly, the true gospel. And he has enough elements of it that you would recognize him as a brother and say, that's a brother. Because he, he seems to know the true gospel. And yet, at every turn, he's seeking to pervert it, seeking to trouble you, and seeking to bring you into bondage. That's a wolf. See, wolves aren't dangerous if they're out in the world. They're just do, get, do, making their business plans and seeking their pursuits and whatever. They're not dangerous to the church. The wolves that are dangerous to the church are the ones that come into the sheepfold and are speaking. They're thieves and robbers. They come in by another way and they seek to devour sheep. And unfortunately, many sheep listen to them. And not only that, but many sheep get offended when you say that is not supposed to be your brother. That, that person's a wolf. They say, how can you? Somebody got on my wall and said, how can, he didn't tell me who I was talking about. How can you say a wolf who believes, is, is someone who believes 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5? How can you say that's not your brother? And I kept asking him to clarify, who are you talking about? What are you, when, who have I said that is gen, has demonstrated that they are a believer in Christ that uh, I've said is a wolf? And they made the litmus test, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. So I think we should talk about that a little bit. This, this is a sacred cow that will offend people. But uh, 1 Corinthians 1 through 5, we've learned to say that that is the gospel. And I think we should say that contains the gospel. Because 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5 tells us that Christ died. The message that we believe, that was preached to us, that we need to hold in mind and saves us, is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and rose from the dead after he was buried after three days uh, he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures that message saves us but what is the message Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures was buried was raised again on the third day According to the scriptures. What scriptures? 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5? No. Now here's, let's say you're on an island and you've never seen the Bible before and a bottle comes and it's got in it 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. You read it and you've never heard of any, you've never seen the Bible. There's no Bible. You just got this slip of paper that has these verses. Do you know what words are not in it? The blood the cross, Jesus, God, the Son of God, uh, who, Christ, who's Christ? Is that Christopher? Is that short for Christopher? There's no explanation that Christ is the man that God appointed, who uh, he anointed to accomplish his work, right? And there's no mention that it's Jesus Christ, Je Jehovah's salvation, you know. Uh, there's no mention that he is God himself. He's God and yet he's man. Uh, God in the flesh, the word made flesh, that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Nor does it describe to you what it means that he died for your sins. You know, you could die for somebody's sins. Like, you could go to jail. Uh, or you could be shot. You could be falsely accused and die for somebody and, and, and executed. And it was for someone else's sin. But that death wouldn't redeem that person. That person may still get caught and die. Uh, that person, that, that death didn't purchase them. That death didn't atone for anything they did. You were just falsely accused and you got executed. What is, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Is that what we're talking about? This Christopher guy? Uh, some guy died. And then he was raised on the third day. Third day from what? Now we know from the scriptures that he was, it was the third day after he died. But a pagan might read that and say third day after the comet, uh, the third the Aquarius millennium, uh, that he'll, he will raise, you know, who Christ. I mean, the, the new agers will say Christ, but they mean, you know, one avatar of many. The Mormons believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5 is scripture, and they even will say that they'll agree that yeah, that message saves you. But who's Christ? Well, he's the brother of Lucifer, and Adam's his father, and Adam is God the Father, and 
no, his death doesn't actually pay for your sins. An Arminian will tell you his death didn't pay for your sins. Hey, so-called free gracer from GES who wrote a commentary will say uh, that his the death of Christ did not lift the wrath of God off of you. It didn't accomplish that. So, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5 is a good pointer for what the gospel is. But just because someone, be if someone says, I believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, that's their testimony. But until they speak God's testimony, we te receive the testimony of God concerning his son. We just, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. This is the testimony which is testified concerning his son. Whoever has the son has the life. If they deny that you have the life, they are disagreeing with God's testimony concerning his son, even though they say that they're a believer. Well, I believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. So you need a little more to know if somebody's a believer, and it's not they believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5 is in the Bible and it's the gospel, and yet they deny. There's people who come to my wall, they seem like believers for a long time until they said that Christ is a, a created being or that Christ is the Father. You know, you, you don't know if somebody's a believer until you know what it is they profess to believe. And this is how 1 John says we test the spirits. This by what they confess and what they deny. And unfortunately, in most Christian circles, you never learn what somebody believes about Christ because you guys don't, people don't talk about Christ. They don't talk about the doctrine of Christ. They talk about everything Christian, but, and they may even say Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And yet, if you were to ask them, start interviewing them, well, is he, is he divine? Is he the embodiment of the Godhead? Is he, did he purchase my, did he purchase me? Am I his? Do I have the life? And they say no. Well, now they have revealed that no matter how much they said Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, they don't agree with the God's testimony concerning his son. And now they're bringing another gospel. They came in under the true, but now reveal that they don't. Okay, so people are mad because I've said somebody's a wolf. I don't even know who I said was a wolf, but I, I know that I believe that there are wolves who have channels who claim to be free grace and will tell you first Corinthians 15, one through five, you believe that and get to go to heaven when you die. It's a free gift, but everything else is by works and you people are lazy and you're looking for a license to sin. That's another thing, by the way, if you're, the more you preach the grace of Christ, the people who come out of the woodworks and tell you you're looking for a license to sin, they reveal that they are an antichrist. It's not because they hate you. Who cares if they hate me? It's what they say about the doctrine of Christ. They strip justification of its benefits and have a new definition of justification that's by works from James and says that that's by law keeping in the flesh in order for you to avoid punishments for your sin because the wrath of God is still on you when you do sin. Uh, or earn a wage as if you're a slave and not a son and an heir. And at the beam of the, you know, God's going to kill you early and he's going to take you out and you don't have fellowship with him. And then you're going to be beaten at the beam of seat. And then you're going to be in outer darkness for during the kingdom. Weeping and gnashing your teeth is a punishment for your sins. A punishment upon punishment upon punishment. The beatings in this life, the so-called chastening, which they misinterpret. The taking you home early, killing you, and then beating you at the whip, whipping post at the Bema Seat, because that's what they believe, and then throwing you in outer darkness. But at least you get to go to heaven when you die. Eventually you'll be in heaven. I was under a doctrine that taught that in a more sophisticated way for 10 years, and it was awful. I wasn't, I was more miserable than before I was saved. Um, and by the way, that's Catholic purgatory. Catholic purgatory, the only thing is, is the difference is they don't tell you how long you'll be in there. Um, and they say that you could buy your way out or people could buy your way out through repentance and good works. But the so-called free grace position with this other form of justification from James totally undermines people's assurance. Um, it, it gives them a gutted gospel that says, yeah, you're going to heaven when you die, but you're not pleasing to God. You don't, you're not going to be blessed. You're going to be punished. Um, and it's a it's a form of Catholic purgatory. And I, why not just say then all the Catholics are my brothers? Because they say you're going to heaven when you die. They say Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. They do it more than us. Every Catholic mass and, you know, only say the word and I shall be healed and all that. 
Aren't they all the brothers? No, we, we recognize by the doctrine what do they testify concerning the work of Christ and its effect? You know, now again, it's one thing to be confused and ignorant. We're all confused and ignorant. It's another thing to seek to bring people into bondage. Now that's a wolf. I don't care how much they talk about 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. And even say, for going to heaven is a free gift. If they're actively working to undermine your confidence today so that on the basis of justification, you cannot stand before God knowing that even though I'm ungodly, I stand before him, I'm bold before him, and I know he's pleased to have me. Uh, if you don't, if you, if you are undermining that at every turn with every message you do and stripping justification of its benefits and using the scripture and twisting them to do that, you're a wolf. I don't care if you're a believer or not. You've got the teeth out and you're devouring sheep. So this guy, there was a guy who was just really mad and I get a bunch of people who are new subs and they'll quickly unsub when they find out that I take a pretty strong stand. They don't understand. They don't stick around to listen to the teaching or there's people who their favorite teacher does exactly what I say. Even though I may never have mentioned their teacher by name, when they find out that their teacher teaches the doctrine that I teach against, they get offended. And this is a tactic they'll say, are you saying so-and-so is not saved? And they try to bring up names and make it about people. I really try to resist that temptation and say, no, I'm talking about a doctrine. You're talking about people. I'm talking about doctrine. Um, but watch the ones who say, what are you saying? I'm not a believer because they're manipulating you. They want you to say, well, yeah, you're probably a believer. You're my brother. Okay, then you have to accept me so that they could stick around and slap you in the face more. And hopefully you'll pay them to do it. These are wolves. Um, test them by the doctrine, not by how nice they are. And we're getting real laser sharp about the doctrine because the doctrine is getting clearer and clearer. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our hope of glory. Christ is our life. Christ is our wisdom. He is our way. It's a person. And they don't believe that. That's why they say, when you say Christ is my sanctification, the way I'm sanctified is not incrementally by commandment keeping, because I can't. They'll say, well, no, he said you can keep my commandments. And they don't distinguish between the law and the new commandment, which is true in those who believe because the darkness has passed and the light now shines, uh, which is to believe on Jesus Christ and to love one another. And it's a love that's not like Cain, seeking to kill his brother because he hates his righteousness, which is Christ. Um, we need to be wise. You know, uh, people are after your crown. You need to guard your crown. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to what you have. And let no one steal your crown. Let no man steal your crown. Paul, that's what Jesus said. Paul said, be careful, beware, lest anyone spoil you, uh, carry you off as spoil through your philosophy, through their philosophy, I'm sorry, an empty deceit and not according to Christ. Christ is the one who's everything to us. And when we say that, they say, you're just looking for a license to sin. What does that reveal? They don't believe Christ is your life. When we say, no, Christ is my sanctification. And it's by not by commandment keeping, it's by renewal. It's as I enjoy him in fellowship. They say you can't fellowship with him. He's mad at you. His wrath is upon you until you repent and confess your sins and repudiate them. Then you can come back, you know, and you will be punished. <laughs> well, then I can't come back. I'm going to run from him, not to him. It is in running to him boldly, even when I sin, that my victory and I reign in life. That's how we reign in life. And we're, we're seeing that in Romans 6, you know. Um, what does it mean that the sin shall not reign over you for you're not under law, but under grace? It means that I there's nothing pushing me back. I'm running to Jesus Christ because while I was a sinner, God commended his love in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And when I went through Romans 5, I, I talked about how, look, the serpent on the pole, all those people were cursing God. While they were cursing him, Moses is making a serpent. And he raises them up on the pole and he says, all you have to do is look and live. And that is commending. Commending means to show, to show something and say, hey, look at this. So while we were sinners, while we were blasphemers, while we were sinning, while we were committing adultery, while we were fornicating, while we were doing all those things, God commanded and said, look, look at my love for you. And what is that? Christ died for our sins. 
Christ died for us while we were sinners. That is the commendation of God's love, and it is the testimony of God concerning his son that he gave him for us. And that is how we live. That's how we're sanctified. When we're sinning, God is commending his love towards us, and we need to look away to it and drink of it. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't allow consequences for sin and then teach us through it. But he doesn't punish us for our sins. He commends his love towards us and bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God and heirs. And it's as we swing into agreement with God's testimony concerning his son that we are washed and we enjoy the fellowship because the spirit bears witness and sheds the love of God brought in our heart by the Holy Spirit, which he's given to us. And that is our sanctification. And they reveal that they don't believe that when we say that's how we do it. And they say, you're just looking for a license to sin. You just love your sin. No, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. They say that because we say, no, it's not by commandment keeping. It's by Jesus Christ. To them, Jesus Christ is just a verse in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. That's just a verse in the scripture. I, I'm talking about getting to work around here. You need to keep the commandments. No, Christ is my commandment. He's the one I keep. He's the one I run to. He's the one I cleave to and can't do anything apart from him. And it is as he manifests himself as the spirit in me, as a washing and a renewing in the knowledge of his love, that I enjoy the benefit of him washing my feet, which is the practical application of sanctification. They don't believe that. If they if they believed that, they wouldn't say that we're antinomian when we teach it. Oh, you're just lawless looking for a license to sin. When we teach that this is how it's done, it's a person. They don't see a person. They just see doctrines. So, and yet the way we test is by the doctrine. What do they confess? Do they What do they deny? If they say, yeah, Christ died for my sins, and yet tell me practically that that means nothing. You need to work to overcome your sins, and you need to, when you sin, you should expect his punishment, then that means Christ didn't die for my sins, according to the scriptures. You may say Christ died for my sins, but are you saying it according to the scriptures? Because 1 Corinthians says that the message we heard is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And in that death, we died. Do they testify that, that we died to sin and to the law? No, you didn't die to the law. That's just circumcision. No, Paul said it was the law, thou shalt not covet, from the Ten Commandments, the moral law, so-called, that was death to him and killed him and worked, and sin worked all manner of covetousness in him by the law. The motions of the sins were by that law, not by circumcision. He said circumcision doesn't matter, but a new creature. You can be circumcised or not circumcised, but if you seek to be justified through circumcision, now you're obligated to the whole law. That was the danger of circumcision. And when he's talking about the whole law, he means the moral. James did too when he said, if you break it in one point, he wasn't talking, he wasn't saying if you break circumcision but keep the Sabbath, you're uh, guilty of the Sabbath and circumcision and the feasts and uh, the law of, uh, I don't know, the leper you know, the cleansing of the leper. You're, you're guilty of that one because you broke circumcision. No, he says, what good does it do if you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder? He appealed to the moral law, said if you break it at one point, you've broken the whole thing. So don't they, they practice witchcraft by twisting words and saying, no, that's not talking about that. And that's not talking about that. Tell you you're not free from the law. You didn't die to it. Deny all that, which is to deny your death with Christ according to the scriptures. So that's a wolf. Okay, now that doesn't mean every believer has to know all that. Most believers won't know that stuff because they are listening to wolves. But we're talking about people who actively try to undermine your assurance. We're not talking about someone who's confused about their own assurances seeking the truth. We're talking about people who actually twist the scripture to attack believers. Um, not, and it's not that they called us names. You know, people say, well, you call, you, you attack them. That's slander. And no, I get emails all the time saying, you know, I'm tired of the grace community slandering people. Slander means I've said something that's not true. I'm t telling you what they teach. And then they get mad and I teach it. <laughs> they get offended and then they teach it more and they show what they really believe. And everybody who's been listening to me says, oh my gosh, I thought that guy was grace. It's not because I ever even said their name. It's because they get offended and start railing at us about our doctrine. Okay, that's uh, then they do slander us because they lie about what we teach. But 
we're not slandering people. We're just telling you what the truth and what is the spirit of error and what the doctrine of Christ is versus other things. And they're all offended. Okay. And they're seeking to bring people into bondage and they're wolves. Okay. I don't care if they say they believe we don't receive the testimony of men. The testimony of God concerning his son is how we test whether someone is a brother, whether uh, a teacher is a wolf. That's what we test against. Okay, I think I've said enough. I speak on this quite a lot, but I've got a couple hundred new subs. Greg Jackson, by the way, is back on his channel. He decided to do a new channel for new videos and change the name of the old. The main point was that he has to break his name from it uh, so that his family, who didn't sign up to have a YouTube channel, is free from harassment. Okay, he can take the harassment. Don't talk about Greg and say he's this or that. He can take the harassment. But he doesn't want his family to have to because they didn't sign up for that. And they're not required to. So, uh, all right. Have a good day. Take care.